Let's continue with the nervous system and keep looking at sensory receptors. Now let's talk about some responses of these sensory receptors here. First thing we see is a graded potential. A graded potential results from the interaction of a sensory receptor with some type of stimulus. And again, there are many different stimuli that that could refer to. These graded potentials are weaker than an action potential. We talked about action potentials before. And these graded potentials only occur in one small area of the cell membranes. That makes them a little bit different right there, too. <clears throat> and the magnitude of this potential will depend on the frequency of the stimulus. Remember, that's how the nervous system works is by that FM system. And these potentials here can weaken as they travel further. Now, looking below that with these graded potentials, notice you got primary and secondary receptors. These primary receptors occur when axons conduct action potentials. Those are electric signals in response to some type of stimulus. The secondary receptors cause the release of a neurotransmitter. Notice that's something different you didn't see with the first. And with these secondary, good examples are smell, taste, hearing, and balance. Looking at some other terms here like accommodation. Now, don't forget that accommodation is also called adaptation. And adaptation is the decreased sensitivity to a continued stimulus. A good example of that is say you walk into a region where there's a very bad smell. When you first walk in, you notice it a great deal. It seems very, very strong. But if you stay there for a long period of time, <clears throat> it seems to lessen. That's what's meant by adaptation, the lessening of a stimulus over time. After that, we see propyl receptors. We've mentioned these before in other regions, like we talked about the spinal cord and different reflex arcs. These provide information about precise body position and the rate of movement. Think about if you have your eyes closed, you know where your hands are at, if they're down at your side or whether up above your head and so on down the line. By changing the tension in a joint, specifically in a tendon, that's where these propyl receptors are at. And they can detect that change in tension. After this, you see there are two different types of propyl receptors. There are the slowly adapting tonic receptors and then the rapidly adapting basic. But looking back at the tonic, these accommodate very slowly. i tell you an example of this is knowing body position, where the phasic accommodate rapidly. This lets you know when the body's moving. So again, whether your eyes are closed or not, you know these things because of these propyl receptors. Now let's look at some sensory nerve tracts here also. Remember, if we're talking about something being sensory, it is conducting an action potential to the spinal cord and brain. Remember, there's always incoming signals. Each pathway involved will have a specific modality. And anytime you hear about modality, you think about a different type of some type of sensory receptor being used at this time. How are these nerve tracts identified and named? You look at the names, they'll tell you a great deal. The first half of the word indicates the origin of the nerve tract. And the second half indicates its termination, where it ends up. So let's look at this enterolateral system and specifically at the spinothalamic tract. You can tell by the name spinothalamic. Got something to do with the spinal cord and the thalamus. Remember we've mentioned before that thalamus is a primary sensory relay center. This tract here conveys pain, temperature, light touch, pressure, tickle, and itch. And this is a three neuron system. When you hear about primary, secondary, and tertiary, always think first, second, and third. That's what they refer to. So with this three neuron system, the first primary will originate from the periphery, in other words, somewhere out in the body, to that posterior horn of the spinal cord. Here it'll synapse with an inner neuron. So here's your secondary neuron. This will cross over to the opposite side of the spinal cord and brain, enter the spinothalamic tract, and ascend up to the thalamus. And then we have this tertiary third, ending up at the somatic sensory cortex, where you detect some type of sensation. Next here in the dorsal column, we had the medial lemniscal system. Now this carries sensations of two-point discrimination. Remember if you got like two points which are very close together, and say they're very sharp, that way you can detect the different sensations. You have different densities of sensory receptors around the body. You had two sharp points very close together and touched them to your face or tongue. You'd probably be able to tell that's two different points. But you take them in the same position, touch your back, it's probably going to feel like one. It's all about the density of those little sensory receptors. So in addition to that, we've also got the propyl reception, pressure, and vibration. Going back to the cerebrum and cerebellum. Within these regions here, 
we have these fasciculus gracilis. This here is involved with sensations coming from inferior up to the mid-thoracic level. And then we have the fasciculus cuneatus. This carries impulses from above mid-thorax. Below this, we see the primary neurons do have cell bodies in the dorsal root ganglion. We saw that back in the spinal cord before. These axons are going to enter the spinal cord. They're going to come up to the medulla oblongata without decusating, meaning crossing over, where they're going to synapse with secondary neurons. Now, these secondary neurons are going to decusate, cross over, ascend up to the thalamus, which again is a major sensory relay center. And then the tertiary third neurons are going to project up to the somatic sensory cortex. Let's look here next at the trigeminothalamic tract. Now notice where this originates here. Cranial nerve number five is called the trigeminal. That's obviously the first part of this name you see up at the top. These fibers are going to join that spinothalamic tract in the brain stem. We've looked at brain stem connecting spinal cord to brain before. And they're going to carry information from the face, nasal cavity, and oral cavity. Next, we have the spinocerebellar system. These are connecting spinal cord to cerebellum. So we've seen those structures before. This will carry proprioceptive information to the cerebellum. Most of that's unconscious without your conscious thought being involved with it. And the actual movements are monitored and compared to cerebral information representing intended movement. This will give you responses to changes in tension. We talked about things like this, maintaining postural muscles. Next, we have just some other sensory tracts. The first one we have here is the spinoolivary. This is very important in controlling movement. When you talk about coordinating movement between muscles, and this is also greatly associated with balance. Below this, you see the spinotectal sensory tract. This is involved with reflexes that turn the eyes and head towards the point of cutaneous stimulation. In other words, say somebody walks up behind you and they touch you on the shoulder, you just instinctively turn and look in that direction. That's the reflex they're referring to here. There are many descending pathways modifying the sensation too. So with your conscious thought, you can to a certain degree reinforce or try to inhibit these autonomic responses. So from the cortex, you may reduce the conscious perception of sensations. From the cortospinal tracts, you can send branches to ascending tracts and release neuromodulators such as endorphins. These will help to control movements of the limbs and the trunks. Looking on with other sensory information here. Remember we talked about before the primary somatic sensory cortex. That's your general sensory area right there. We looked at where that's located in the brain. We have general sensory input. Some of those general senses are pain, pressure, and temperature. But you also have the taste area. It's more specific. That's back in the inferior end of the postcentral gyrus. We have the olfactory cortex on the inferior surface of the frontal lobe. We have the primary auditory cortex, which is at the superior part of the temporal lobes, and then the visual cortex and the occipital lobes, which are way to the very back of your brain. We've seen those back in brain pictures, too. And when you look at these association areas, that's about a process of recognition. You have this somatic sensory region. Now that's posterior to the primary somatic sensory cortex we've seen before. You also have this visual association. Now that's anterior to the visual cortex, and that compares present visual information to past visual information. In other words, it allows you to recognize things you've seen before. But looking back at the somatic sensory cortex, something else that's mentioned here is a homunculus, which will look like a very odd picture if you ever see one. What it is is a distorted model of a person drawn to reflect the space that human body parts occupy on the sensory and motor cortex. So you can see one of these for the sensory cortex and one for the motor, two different ones. But what they show are body parts shown in distorted sizes. If there's a large number of sensory receptors in a place like your tongue, face, something like that, that will represent a very large area, region on this homunculus. Other areas of the body with fewer sensory receptors <clears throat> would represent a distorted smaller region than what you would usually see on a person. And you can do the same thing for the motor cortex too. Looking at referred pain, here's we have a sensation in one region of the body where that region is not the source of the stimulus. 
If you think about common examples of this right here, think about sometimes when somebody has a heart attack, they tend to gr grab their left shoulder and upper limb. It's believed that's the body being very unassociated. In other words, not usually perceiving any associated signals from your heart. So since it's a pain signal from the heart is so foreign to the brain, it's thought that the brain thinks that's actually a signal coming from some other region. And since the sensory region of your left upper limb is located very close to that sensory region for your heart, it's thought that the brain just confuses those signals. Could be. Phantom pain here occurs in people who have had an appendage amputated. Maybe even something as simple as a removed tooth could cause this. So phantom tells you there's no really nothing there which could be generating the pain signal, but the pain is perceived. And then below that's chronic pain. This is not a response to an immediate injury to a tissue. The cerebrum and the thalamus might be malfunctioning and misinterpreting discomfort as pain. And that might be seen in things such as migraine and back pain. 